I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this is Outside My Window. Our guest on this segment is Bruce Rainey. He is president and CEO of the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame. Now, before that, Bruce enjoyed a 23-year career as a broadcaster with the CBC. For the past 13 years, he was host of CBC News Compass, the evening news program for Prince Edward Island. In that role, he helped the show achieve the status of number one rated CBC Supper Hour news broadcast in the country. In addition to his news duties, Rainey is nationally known for his work with CBC Sports. Having covered sports ranging from hockey to equestrian, he's been a broadcaster at eight Olympic Games and most recently provided play-by-play for curling at the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea. Bruce Rainey began his broadcasting career in 1989 at Radio CJLS in Yarmouth. During his time at CJLS, he was twice named Yarmouth's Volunteer Citizen of the Year. When he left for Halifax in 1995, then-Mayor Charles Crosby awarded Bruce a key to the town. In March of 2004, he researched, co-produced, and hosted Great Expectations, a half-hour primetime documentary that introduced the country to hockey sensation Sidney Crosby. And with all of that, Bruce is, Bruce is also an author. We'll talk about that. Welcome, Bruce, to the podcast. How nice it is to be on Outside My Window, Gary. After all these years, it is comforting. It is lovely to hear your voice. Great oh, to be with you guys. Thank you so much. It's great to hear your voice, Bruce. We've got many memories, and we'll talk about uh, some of those. So I know you had mentioned one time when you and I were chatting uh, back when you were a young fellow living at home, uh, broadcasting wasn't in your mind at the time. You were uh, kind of, well, at least your parents, I guess, if I'm correct, uh, kind of were looking to you go into the medical field. <laughs> yeah, there was a family hope that I would become a, an orthopedic surgeon. That was always a, sort of a leaning of mine. I, I would have loved Gary to have become a professional athlete when you're, however, scraping six feet tall with no speed and no jumping ability, you're limited. So I figured the next best thing was to, to maybe treat athletes as an orthopedic surgeon. And so that was what my plan was all through school. But then I just started to get this broadcast bug. I would, I would MC events in high school, and I loved that, and I had a an all-night radio show in Halifax. I love that. I had an East Link cable show, which is easily the worst thing that ever aired on any TV station anywhere, but still, I love that. And so I got this bug, and I'll never forget sitting down with my mom and dad and telling them that, you know, um, I think I'm going to suspend this orthopedic surgeon dream and go become a DJ in Yarmouth. <laughs> and uh, mom had served that night a macaroni beef concoction, I recall it, and it got very cold, as did the mood in the room, uh, they they were uh, they were a bit stunned, but to their credit, to their credit, after the silence and after my explanation, and after I promised that you know if it didn't work out, I would have a degree to fall back on. They said, "Well, go fulfill your dream," and that was a a long time ago now. And I think probably ten days after that macaroni dinner, I was working with you at CJLS in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. You got to admit, though, uh, uh, that's a complete one hundred and eighty. I mean, certainly broadcasting is at one end of the spectrum and doctoral profession is at the other end. It is, no question, Quinn, and that's why they were surprised. But, you know, Gary will back me up on this. When when you get the bug, you, you get the bug. Gary, you were just a kid when you got the bug, and there's there's something about this communication business. It's a wonderful thing to be able to disseminate information in a hopefully – informative and entertaining way it's a wonderful thing to be able to to tell stories and on radio it's a wonderful thing to be able to try to paint these pictures with your words it's a great challenge and you never really ever get it right but when you come close it feels really good and there's nothing quite like it so uh you know what i'm happy to say that uh i never looked back from that day and i've enjoyed every minute of it since it really gets in your blood doesn't it bruce that's it and you know you love it gary you uh, you know, emceeing events in high school. There, there's something really special about about knowing that you've done a good job, you know, disseminating information to an audience or, you know, at, at some point making them laugh, making them think, making them cry, making them ponder. It's, um, it's a remarkable tool, and it's one you never take lightly or for granted because it's really important. But you realize as you're doing it, you know, if you love it, it fills you up, and it gives you a feeling that few other things can. 
And Bruce, you you were a na- you are a natural. I remember the first time uh, that I heard you on the air when you came to CJLS. I thought, wow, this guy's so young, but he sounds like he's been in broadcasting for for years. You know what, Gary? In, in a way, I kind of had been, and I'll tell you why. When I was when I was growing up, I was like any other kid who would watch the hockey and baseball games on the weekend with my dad, and for whatever reason. I would, you know, I'd be intrigued by what Guy Lafleur was doing or by what George Brett was doing, but I was also intrigued by how Danny Gallivan was calling the game for Hockey Night in Canada or, or Dick Stockton for the station out of Bangor, Maine. And I, I always loved, you, you can tell, a great broadcaster really really gets in your heart and your soul, and when they can bring you into the game and you, you listen to the rise and the fall of the voice, you listen to how, to how the intonation changes, you know, the, the best ones make it almost like they're, they're singing a song. They're providing a melody, and, and the game is like the lyrics, you know. And it's that always intrigued me. It fascinated me, and it was it was fun to try to emulate my heroes as I got older. So, Bruce, tell us how you came to be at CJLS. You could have gone to really any radio station anywhere. You know, the big city, it was the CBC. What brought you to CJLS in Yarmouth? Well, I was trying to get a chemistry degree at Dalhousie in Halifax, and. And almost on the exact same day I graduated, I was working um, at that time overnight at a station called CHNS in Halifax. And the program director at CHNS in Halifax knew the program director at CJLS in Yarmouth, knew that there was a desire to find a morning man. There was a great guy by the name of Wayne Leslie who used to do the morning show at CJLS. And he was moving on, I think, to BC. And so the job was open. And so I was able to come down for the, the audition, the interview. I wore a just a horribly ill-fitting gray suit. I think it was a three-piecer with a bad vest. Spit shine shoes, hair parted in the middle, looking as good as I could. It was a tough tough task back in those days, but I, I guess it went okay because I guess, you know, two and a half, three weeks later, I was on the air with you at CJLS, and, and that was my first broadcasting job. And I'll never forget in the negotiations, um, and I always tell kids to this day, make sure you love it because it's quite likely that your first job will not allow you to buy a Porsche. Because my first salary was 12500 a year with the promise that if the first year went well, they would bump me up to 14000 a year. Now, I was single, no kids, loving the job. That was fine for me. But um, that, that's a sense of, you know, what it's like to start out and, and how you have to love it and how you have to believe in yourself and, and gradually work your way up a ladder. Yeah, those who get into broadcasting certainly don't do it for the money, and and, and that goes back to to what you said and that love and that that passion. Bruce, we all watched, interestingly, uh, when you started at CJLS, and it didn't take long for you to make that morning show yours. You really put your own personal stamp on that. How did you do that? I think, Gary, I was always... um... I always loved the community. I always loved to name dropping is not the right term, but if, if I met someone or, or was lucky enough to host their event, I love to talk about it on the air and, and bring the community into the show. And I think I always realized, and, and you did too, you know, the, the show is as much theirs, the audience, as it is yours, the, the hosts, and you're only as good as they are. If they don't want to tune you in anymore, all of a sudden it's not so much fun when you know you're broadcasting to no one. So, I think you, you always you always know that the audience is the ultimate arbiter. Um, I like to have a lot of fun. You like to have fun, which was great. You were the ultimate partner for me. Um, off off the cuff, you know, I was never a guy that liked script at all. I, I preferred to just let it come from the, the heart and the head and see where it landed. And I had a, a great old mentor by the name of Lou LeBlanc who told me once that the best broadcasters are those that can climb a tree, get totally stuck in the tree, and then get back down without anybody knowing they were stuck. Meaning that, you know, you're always going to talk yourself into a corner, but if you're, you know, deft enough to get yourself out of that corner without anybody knowing, then it can be a kind of a magical storytelling uh, piece of whatever you're trying to do at the time. So that, that's what I loved about it, and it was just off the cuff and fun, and I love the town, and I love the community, and I, I think I just let that shine through. And, and that love, I know, was reciprocated by the, the community. And there came a point uh, um, early on in, in your career at CJLS where you also took part of the afternoon, the, the noon hour, and really transformed that, again, putting your own personal stamp on that. Talk about that, would you? 
That was a show called Rainy at Noon, Gary, and I recall our station manager, Grant Wyman. Um, I was at CJLS for five and a half years, probably at about the three-year mark. He came to me and offered me a new challenge, and it was to host the morning show from 6 to 9 and then do this noon hour show, noon to 1, rainy at noon. He, he called it infotainment, a bit of information, a lot of entertainment, and whatever was on it was whatever we could come up with for that day. And that, to me, um, you know, I, I would never recommend that, that kids today, if you want to get in this business, go to journalism school and get your degree and do it the proper way. But that, for me, was that was my Ph.D., because you never knew what was going to happen on, on that show every day. It was essentially open line, open airwaves. And I recall a time vividly where a Mrs. Dontremont from the West Pubnico Garden Club was booked to come in to talk about her begonias. And uh, about five minutes before the show, I got a call from her saying that Claude, the guy's name was Claude, had finally asked her out to lunch, and she wasn't driving to Yarmouth. She wanted to go out with Claude. So that left me with an hour to fill and no guest. And you very quickly learn how to open phone lines, uh, engender discussion, figure out topics on the fly, get into and out of segments. And it was just a wonderful tool and so much fun. And it also is where you debuted one of my favorite impersonations of my lifetime, your Marlon Brando Godfather impersonation, <laughs> which you would do for me probably once or twice a week, and it always left me tear-filled and crying on the on the pavement there. It was fantastic. With Nickerson. <laughs> now, I'm going to, i got to tell you, Rainey, i got to send Vito up to uh, see you, and, uh, you know, for payment for that. Uh, so, uh, expect a knock on you your door sometime. You still got it. The man still got it. <laughs> I'm rusty. <laughs> it's all right. It's still good. And I don't think you were the only one that was the fan of that. I, I believe there was a comment on our uh, on our group from Greg Cook, uh, wondering whether or not uh, uh, that impersonation was going to make a uh, another appearance. We had a lot of fun, Bruce, over those years. You were just such an inspiration to work with. Uh, you were so professional, but you, you seemed to make it so easy. But you and I had a lot of fun. I remember one particular day I went down, that's when Tim Hortons was down below us at Centertown Square. I went in to get a coffee. And a couple of the ladies that were working there came over and said, what in goodness names um, are you and Bruce doing Early in the morning, we hear all this noise upstairs. <laughs> so I'll let you tell that story. Well, the key to that, Gary, the key to that was to find a long song. And thank God, back in those days, we were playing Hotel California by the Eagles or American Pie by Don McLean or Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Lightfoot. Those are all about six to seven minutes long. So I put the song on, and they were on 45s back in the day. And then I'd run out into the hall, and you would have a chair ready for me that had wheels on the bottom. And for whatever reason, you and I found it immensely entertaining for me to sit on the chair and you to push me down the hall at breakneck speed. And what I would try to do is I would try to eject just before I hit the wall. And we found this incredibly funny. The one day we didn't find it funny, however, though, is when I mistimed my ejection from the seat and put my size, size 12 Mikey through the drywall that was just outside the studio. And you and I were looking at a gaping hole in the wall at about 6.30 in the morning, knowing that the bosses were coming in two hours later. So we decided after a lot of discussion, neither of us could drywall the darn thing. We weren't very handy. We'd just tell the truth. And thank God there was a sense of humor in the building that day. And I remember I used to time you. Because you used to run, too. You used to run from the control room way down the hall yeah. around to the bathroom, and I would time you. Yes, we would. Uh, we took this seriously. I think we even bought a stopwatch for this. And, uh, yeah, you would challenge me. I think 11.49 seconds was my record. I wouldn't hit that today. I'd be about double that today. But that was back in my fleet of foot days. But, yeah, you know what? And that, that's part of, you know, Gary, you know, with that morning show, you and I were in there every day, just you and me, and most of the time, the great Wayne Norman, just the three of us for about three and a half hours every day, just the three of us. It's the ultimate sort of team bonding thing. And if you don't get along with the other people, then that's just hell. But we really got along and we really found ways to make it fun both on and off the air. And 
man, I remember those years with such immense fondness. It was just a great time. Oh, so do I, Bruce. There was one other incident I recall when something got broken, and that was uh, one of the on-air lights. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. So, so outside of a studio, if you're inside the studio and you flip on the mic, outside of the studio there's a light that lights up to tell people not to come in. It says on-air so you don't come in and get, get interrupted. And why we had a Frisbee is beyond me, but we did, and we were just rifling that thing up and down the hall, and... You obviously had a fear of great speed, because when I really hummed one at you, you just ducked out of the way, and this thing just blasted the on-air light. Now, thank goodness, Engineer Guy knew where there was a, uh, a backup, and so he came in early and replaced the whole thing, swept up the glass. Nobody knew about it then. I guess they know about it now. <laughs> That's right. Bruce, while you were in Yarmouth, uh, you were uh, twice awarded uh, citizen of the year that that's pretty significant it was really special gary and i um you know it's the sort of thing i mentioned earlier i when i, when I was in yarmouth i didn't have kids and i was single and and you know the nights were essentially free and so i always thought that you know if, if you have a group that has worked really hard to put together an event and they ask you to help help and and you know you can make that event two to three percent better just by offering you know good mc services or a couple of jokes here and there or or some nice introductions of special guests whatever then yeah go do it you know and and i always tried i i really tried to say no as seldom as possible i i like to help out really anybody who called and you know yourself in a, in a small town these these events these fundraisers they mean so much and and they really have a, a lasting effect and they really impact people's lives and you know, whenever I could say yes, I did, and I'm, you know, was happy to do so then, and looking back, really happy I did. So, do you think? Do you think the uh, rainy night in Yarmouth will uh, make a resurgence as much as the uh, Don Coleone uh, impersonation? <laughs> yeah, they were they were fun too, Quinn. But you know, I think you two guys are the only two that even remember I was down there. So, hopefully. Hopefully this interview jogs a few memories, but what you're referring to there is we would do a, a yearly show to benefit the Yark. I had a lot of fun at that place, a lot of great plays from Annie to Wizard of Oz to Oklahoma. Just some wonderful moments there with the community, and, and so every year we try to do a little concert and have a bit of fun, some comedy, some carols around Christmas time, whatever, and, and give the money to that place. So, yeah, they were fun, and Quinn, you always were the man that managed the sound for us, so... Um, I always appreciated that because I couldn't sing worth a lick and you would somehow find a way to give me a little reverb. So I sounded like uh, Elvis's less successful brother. So I appreciate that years of years gone by too. Well, I, I certainly did uh, sound on a couple of your uh, theatrical productions as well. I remember one just quick story where, where you, you had to play a radio and uh, it, it's, it's also my uh, Ray Zink story where I had Ray record the news piece uh, that was supposed to be part of the, uh, the scene. And, I, and when I had Ray do it, uh, I asked him, I said, can you just ad lib an extra 30 seconds or so? And he said, well, why, why would you need that? I said, because if Bruce doesn't turn the thing off like he's supposed to, I got to have something to keep going. <laughs> and sure enough, one night you, you, you had probably inadvertently missed your cue, but either way, you left it going just a little long, and we, we, I had you covered. Yeah, thanks. I might, I might have just done that on purpose to mess up the show a bit too, but <laughs> that'll be our secret forever. Gary, listen, I want to ask you something. Do you recall... Uh, I don't mean to take this over, guys, but I just want to share this story. No, by all you means. Recall, oh, Gary, please. when CJLS management, in its infinite wisdom, thought that to illustrate the importance of the wonderful group Yarmouth Ground Search and Rescue that does amazing uh, work. Lost in the going, Woods. Yes, Lost in the Woods was the name of the promotion. So and They thought they would send Gary and I, neither of whom, by the way, is a woodsman, to get lost in the woods outside of Carleton uh, with a guide, and we thought we were going to spend maybe one night there. But what happened was, while we were in there, as I recall, there was a real emergency that took ground search and rescue to a real emergency, so they had to suspend their search for us and really go find someone. So we ended up being in there three days. 
<laughs> I, I don't know if we packed for it, but I recall we had a wonderful guide by the name of Eldon who yes. since we were getting bored, and you remember what he, he wanted us to do all the time, Gary? He, he took us out one time for a walk, Bruce. I know you remember this. And yes. as we're walking along in the woods, um, he would reach down, he reached down and pick something up. And he said, oh, look at this. So you and I both went over and see what was in his hand. It was uh, um, a, uh, some kind of, I think it was coyote uh, droppings. <laughs> and, and he was very interested in that, and, and he was a very interesting man, actually. You'd learn a lot from Eldon. And, and he kind of, bro it was dried, and he broke it up in his hand, and he said, see, you can, you can see what the uh, coyote has, has eaten, <laughs> and you and I are kind of looking at each other. I said, well, that's a, yeah. that's a new experience, so, so right? We, we, yeah, we'd, we'd be back in the tent, and he'd say, you guys want to go out and analyze some more animal dung? Right. And why not? Sure. The other thing I remember from that is that engineer Gee, who was with us to make sure we could get a signal from the woods, I'll never forget late at night, if you're not used to a sleeping bag, you can do up that zipper on poor parts of the male body. <laughs> and that's what he did, and he woke us up with a shriek that I still remember this day. So that was an amazing time. Lost in the woods circa 1990, I'm going to say. Also, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, just, just quickly, though, I remember uh, when I was uh, putting together a bit of a slideshow when, for Gary's retirement, I came across a picture of a shirtless Gary Nickerson with a pair of god-awful blue shorts cooking in the wild that's woods. That's the woods. And that's, that's, the woods. that's what it's from is then? No question. We had a little uh, hibachi set up, and Gary was barbecuing the burgers. No question. Definitely. <laughs> and we survived. But you I, know, barely. Do you remember... Bruce, one night, we're, we're in the tent, it's, it's late, it's after dark, and we heard this, gosh, awful noise outside. I thought it was oh, a yeah. bear. Yeah, oh yeah, listen, man, we were, listen, we were, we were half-decent broadcasters, but we were horrendous woodsmen. We were ill-equipped. We could barely even spray the raid. We were very, very inept. Um, thank God for Eldon, and yeah. uh, thank God... You know, we just put our heads back in our sleeping bag and said, let's hope we can get up tomorrow morning and have a show to do. That's right. When you look back, though, Bruce, I mean, some of the promotions that you got roped into over the years must have seemed at the time like a really good idea, but then looking back, eh, maybe not so much. <laughs> well, you know, I remember the night Gary and I spent, spent the whole night in a flower shop oh, trying to yeah. sell tickets for the Y-12 lottery. Um, we would talk about surrounded by begonias. We slept in a flower shop, which was not the most normal thing to do. And um, I, you know, but you know what, Quinn? All of it was fun, and all of it was for a reason. It was to bring attention to something really important. Like I remember spending three nights in a Westphalia Volkswagen Westphalia van while people bought coke to get me out of it, and all the proceeds were going to cystic fibrosis. It was always, you know, it was always a reason to it. Um, it's just that when you when you have guys like Gary and I who aren't that handy then some comedy can enter into the whole thing. I remember uh, one of the more bizarre, I, I don't know if it was a promotion, but you remember that's when they had circuses. Remember when the circus came to town? <laughs> yes, this was on either Kirk Street or 2nd Street. Um, I'm not sure which, but you and I had an elephant race. And you were, you were on an elephant and I was on an elephant, and the hair was like really prickly and wirely it was tough on the tough on the crotch area but you and i hung in there and i think i edged you by a trunk it you was a, a yeah it was a very tight victory but there we were on kirk street racing elephants and and again just great man there was another time gary where we had to go to mcdonald's they had introduced pizza to their menu and you and i had to try to eat as many pizzas as we could individually in about a half hour and i don't think either of us made it in the next morning for work we were just a mess. So all of that stuff is just a, a wonderful part of the memory bank and was so much fun. Absolutely. Only in only in radio. I forgot about the I forgot about the pizza thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Yeah, we did try to consume as much as we could. Um, just before you left for Halifax, Bruce, in, in 1995, you were, a, and this is something that doesn't happen often in the history of the town of Yarmouth, Mayor Charles Crosby awarded you a key to the town, and I know that meant a great deal to you. Oh, it still does. It's, it still hangs in a prominent position in my house in Dartmouth here. Um, I think at the time, um, I could be wrong, but it, I think the mayor had told me they'd only done this three other times, and, and for, for him and for that town to 
<clears throat> to embrace an outsider to, to that extent and, and value the, the contributions I tried to make. That meant so, so much. And he crashed my last ever noon hour show in Yarmouth to present that to me. And I still got a picture of it. And as I say, the key's prominent here. So, yeah, Yarmouth is, um, I try to, you know, um, whenever I'm asked where it all began, you know, I, I was born in Halifax, but I, I'm really clear to people, the, the broadcast career, it began at this cool little radio station in Yarmouth where I learned under people like you and people like Ray Zink. And you can imagine pulling in as a 21-year-old kid, and here's Ray Zink who has won, you know, more awards than you have fingers and toes. And and you just watch him, and you watch how he asks a question, and you watch how hard he works, and you watch how hard he, how long it takes to put a story together, and how beautifully he writes, and how good he is splicing tape. And you watch that, and, and it just is like osmosis. You hope it's osmosis anyway, and that you get some of it into your system. And uh, just remarkable to, to think about him in those days and, and all you were able to pick up if you just kind of watched and listened and learned. Also, too, you know, before you left for Halifax, you, you, you did a couple little stints with Eastlink Community TV, and you did a series in conjunction with NSCC. It was called Burridge Alive. Burridge Alive, and I think we did about 20 episodes where we tried to highlight a different a different course that was being offered at Burridge. And we'd always try to open these with some sort of comedic segment, and some of them worked and some of them really did not work. But that, again, was, Quinn, that was tremendous fun. And, and I loved that because, essentially, it was, again, it was off the cuff and it was unscripted and it was fun. And what went to tape went to tape. It was essentially live. And, yeah, just a great, great learning experience. And East Lincoln in Yarmouth was really kind to me. And, and you mentioned, or I mentioned Ray. One of the highlights of my, my life was when Ray had the trust in me to ask me to, to host a couple of shows on East Link with with people he had in town for a big conference that were major players in Canadian news and broadcast. And, and he, uh, he put the trust in me to, to sort of guide them through an interview. And, and I never forgot that. And it was just such a, a huge boost of confidence that coming from him to me. So just, uh, another wonderful little piece of memory right there. Yeah. Unfortunately we don't have any clips of that, but we do have some clips of the other stuff and we're, we're going to play a couple of those here as we go along. But, uh, you know, some some of the uh, Bruce Rainey antics live on. <laughs> in infamy, my friends, in infamy. <laughs> it's for historical reasons, That's of right. course. Posterity, right. right? Yeah, every, everybody needs a record. That's the problem <laughs> in this business, by the way. <laughs> most jobs, most jobs, you make a mistake and you just come in the next day. In this business, you make a mistake and it's either on tape or on videotape for the rest of your life. So you got to be careful. <laughs> Three, two, one. Given Yarmouth's past connection with the sea and with the numer one more time. Three <laughs> numerous, damn it. Three, two, one. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Given Yarmouth's past connection with the sea and with the numerous sailing vessels that have visited, it was only natural that yachting become a part of our history. In eighteen ninety five the Yarmouth Yacht Club was formed with William Lovett named as the first Commodore. The Club Bergie was a blue triangle with a white diamond insert having a red anchor. Let's go one more time, Quinn. I can do this a little bit smoother. Okay. I missed a key word that you had in there, too, that I should keep in. Okay. As we reach the other... Uh, no. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you just doing that for me, these, tight. right? No, I'm not. <laughs> Excuse me, she's shaking. <laughs> Somebody get this girl some Valium before she does this. <laughs> Quit laughing and even that sucker out. <laughs> I don't think should I, <laughs> I, I, I think we should go all the way around. Oh, I'm thinking is whatever I should have, it shouldn't be that. <laughs> get the instructor. Please get the instructor. This is what you wanted, and I don't like it. No, I, I, I agree with you. Do something with this, please. <laughs> I think uh, I think that's a take. <laughs> that was you don't get any better than that. That scared <laughs> out of me. <laughs> that's awesome. I did something Open wrong there. <laughs> that's because the tip's so hot. Open the oxygen. 
the there duck, you go. The leave, leave the oxygen off in the cool. Holy yeah. that yeah. Leave the oxygen running. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do wrong? Yeah. That was supposed to come on as a, as a sort of <laughs> Oh no, you don't. Keep those. I said it came out like John Bobbitt. John Bobbitt. <laughs> John Bobbitt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bruce, there was a, a point that you wrote a song to commemorate a milestone for the town of Yarmouth. That was nice, too, Gary. It was uh, Yarmouth's 100th birthday, and I remember the town planner at the time was a woman named Kay Moses, and her two instructions to me were, please don't mention fog or pigeons, because at the time, Arthur Thurston was called the Pigeon Man, and, and his story was one that got, I think, national attention, where he was living in a house that was was full of pigeons, his buddies. So, you know, it was uh, that was great. And what we were able to do is record that and give all the proceeds to the, the pediatric ward at the Yarmouth Hospital. And so that thing sold a bunch of cassettes, and, and we were able to make a nice donation. But uh, a lot of fun to be able to write that song and talk about Yarmouth's first mayor, James Lovett, and bring it up to the present mayor, Mayor Crosby at the time. So absolutely. And I, I think, I'm fairly certain that, that a a copy of that song, a cassette version, is buried in a time capsule under the new Yarmouth Town Hall. I'm fairly certain it's in there with a bunch of other things, so that makes me extremely proud, i got to tell you. Yeah, I think you're right, Bruce. It is there, yes. So, Bruce, in 95, you, you left for Halifax. Um, so what, what transpired? What uh, what took you from well, us? <laughs> I, I was, you know what, Gary? I, I had reached the point. I was really happy in Yarmouth, and, you know, had I... Had that been my career, that would have been just fine. I, I loved that town and had great friends. But there was an opportunity that came up. There was a very talented reporter in Yarmouth named Mary Jane Weber who had who had been told that she was going to take over a show called Maritimes Tonight on CBC that had been hosted for years by Frank Cameron and Doug Saunders. They were both retiring at the same time. So she was going to do the news, and she needed a sports and weather person, partner. And she liked me a lot, and, and we were good friends, and she said, why don't you apply? And so I did, and when I came to Halifax for the audition, I think the number I heard was there were 41 people that applied, but I know down deep that she tried really hard for me and made sure that our chemistry was was good that day and that all of the, the segues in and out were really strong. And so, you know, I, I got the job, and it was not because I was unhappy in Yarmouth or anything like that. I was really happy in Yarmouth, but this was um, a bit of a fulfillment of a dream, and I knew it was a chance if I did it right to do things like Hockey Night in Canada for CBC and the Olympics for CBC, and uh, so, yeah, moved on in 95, September 4th, 1995 is when I started at CBC in Halifax, and said goodbye to all of you guys, and, and moved on, and had that wonderful first chapter at CJLS. Bruce, you know, you mentioned that at that point you were single, no wife, no kids, et cetera. Do you think that really helped drive that opportunity forward? Yeah, because <laughs> no question, you, had, you, you, weren't, you weren't tied down. Um, you know, for, for example, I didn't have a wife then who had a job in Yarmouth that would have to, or kids that were in school in Yarmouth who would have to leave school. And it was just, uh, you know, it was a perfect time to make a, a career move and, and head on up the road and try my hand at TV. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, Quinn, I think, you know, I, I hate the expression everything happens for a reason because it kind of takes your own personal impetus out of things, if you believe that. But, you know, I, I do believe that there was a bit of fate involved. It came along at exactly the right time for me, and, um, you know, I was able to come up here and, and make things work pretty well. Bruce, you're uh, you're a father of, of two uh, two children, and uh, and your wife uh, certainly uh, talented in her own right. Yeah, Gary, she's she's the entire talent in the family. Her name's Kendra McGilvery. She's from Anaganish, Nova Scotia, two-time East Coast Music Award winner. She's one of the premier fiddlers you'll ever hear. She came up. She was kind of one of the big three back in the day with Natalie McMaster, Ashley McIsaac, and Kendra McGilvery, and. So, yeah, we met We met during a TV interview, believe it or not. She was releasing a CD, and I was covering that release. And uh, I was pretty impressed by my guest that night, clearly. So, um, anyway, that's a lot. It's 20 years ago now, and, and we're, uh, you know, 20 years into a relationship and two beautiful little boys, so life is really good. And, and what are your boys up to right now? I got a 14-year-old named Mark Quinn, who's a... Uh, you know, good student, incredible tennis player. He's the number one ranked tennis player for his age in Atlantic Canada and top ten in the country. 
I'd love to claim some sort of genetic responsibility for that. That would be a stretch, though. And my little guy is just really funny. He's nine years old, a good student, loves to swim, loves to skate. He's a phenomenal impressionist. He can do every character from the Austin Powers movies. And I know I probably should not have shown those to a nine-year-old, but that's for another podcast. Anyway, uh, they're, they're great little guys. We're having a great time. I couldn't be luckier. You, you might be able to claim the uh, genetics for the comedic. Yeah, although this this guy's way better than me. I, I've got one impersonation for everybody. It sounds exactly the same, just for everybody, whether it's Muhammad Ali or Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm horrible. This guy can do everybody, <laughs> and uh, I, I love his talent. It's it's a, a daily dose of laughter. So with everything you've done, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about your your uh, experiences with the CBC, but just while we're on this, this topic, are, are you the cool dad? Sometimes. I'm, I'm getting less cool, I think. Uh, I, you know, sometimes I am. I'm, I'm, cool when, uh, I'm cool when I know how to reach an athlete that the boys idolize, because I've met them along my path. That's when I'm cool. Uh, I'm cool when they need to drive somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm not bad. Not bad. But I, I think as the years go by, I'll get less cool. I'm okay with that. After your stint, Bruce, with uh, CBC in, in Halifax, uh, you moved to PEI, and uh, wow, you, uh, you helped that show achieve the status of number one rated CBC Supper Hour news broadcast in the country. That's huge. Yeah, it was good. We had, um, it's interesting, Gary, I've been blessed to have two remarkable on-air partners in my career. I had you for six years at CJLS, and I had a guy named Boomer Gallant. Uh, for 13 years in PEI. He's an absolute PEI icon. And what was similar is that you could really, you could go anywhere with him, as I could with you, and know that you weren't going to get offended, and know that something was going to come back, and I wasn't going to stump you or hurt you, or, you know, it was just a very free-flowing relationship. And so I think the viewers liked that a lot. And uh, it was just, a, it's a very good show over there. It's, uh, for that island, it's important, you know, it's important. They they want to know about the latest in the fishery and the latest on the potato fields and the latest with the sports stars. And politics is huge there. It's like a, a religion, a sport. And so I always loved following politics, and it was almost like a sport, so it was my, my two favorite things combined. So PEI was a great 13 years. It really was. And that drove you to write a book? Yeah. Um, what had happened was, Quinn, I, you know, I had reached a point where, where my boys were getting old enough to read, and uh, I had been in broadcast for 25 years, and it was the five-year anniversary of the passing of my weatherman boomer's wife. She died of liver cancer at a really young age, and that was devastating. And so I just wanted to put some stuff down while I still remembered it and, and talk about the important people I'd met along the way. And so wrote a book and gave all the proceeds to the PEI Cancer Treatment Center in, in the memory of boomer's wife. And... It sold a ton, and, and that's just because uh, it was not a great book. It's never going to win a Pulitzer, but but everybody on PEI bought like three copies, right, because they wanted to support the cause. And so, yeah, it reached number six on the Globe and Mail bestseller list, believe it or not. And there's some fun stuff in there. There's a full chapter on Yarmouth and the great moments I had on air at CJLS. And, yeah, it's a, it's a fun read. As I say, it's, it's you're not going to be ever confused for Hemingway or James Michener, but it was fun. Bruce, I, I re going back, I remember when you left Yarmouth, and it was bittersweet for you and, and for all of us at, at CJLS, but we were also very excited for you. And we all watched you, it was the CBC in, in Halifax and then to PEI, and, and then all of us, and wow, here I am watching my friend Bruce Rainey um, on CBC Sports, um, and you traveled... Uh, to South Korea, that was for the 2018 Winter Olympics. You did curling, wasn't it? It was, yeah, covered curling. And, and yeah, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I, I, Gary, that, that's been a, a great chapter in my life as well. I, I've gotten to cover Olympics in Sydney, Australia, Salt Lake City, Utah, Athens, Greece, Torino, Italy, Beijing, um, Rio, Pyeongchang, and Sochi, Russia, and that those have been travels, you know, courtesy of CBC Sports, and and it's a, a lovely chapter. And what I love about sport is that you sit there, and you, you know, you have an idea what might happen. You might even predict what might happen. Some people might bet on what they think will happen. 
you have no idea what's about to happen in the next two to three hours. And for a broadcaster, the challenge of trying to make drama without a script makes sense. And the challenge of making sure your voice is fever pitched at the right moment and calm at other moments, I, I love that challenge. You just, you know, you, you can prepare as much as you can, but when that red light goes on and you are live to a nation, it's a wonderful dose of adrenaline. And the challenge is immense, and trying to meet the challenge, you never do fully, by the way, but trying to meet it is a, a really fulfilling thing. Do you have a favorite sport that you like to broadcast, Bruce, or, or are you an all-round sports kind of guy? I love calling basketball, Quinn. It's always been a favorite of mine. I've grown to love calling curling. When I started at CBC Halifax, the first person, the very first person to run up introduce herself and essentially give me a hug was Colleen Jones and she and I are best friends to this day and <laughs> if you're going to hang with her you better like curling so I learned a lot about it it's a great sport in that the you know the strategy is immense but the athletes are really accessible they want to talk to you and they don't have agents and they're not making millions and they're not spoiled so you can get to know them really well and tell their stories on air so I've enjoyed that a lot but uh you know, anything really, anything that involves sort of a beginning, a middle, and a really cool end, I'm up to I'm up to learn about and call. So it's been a really fun run. After all the years that you spent doing this, do you have a favorite or two or three or four? I was so lucky, Quinn, in Halifax. Here here's the sort of the luckiest confluence of of just moments or time in your life for me. When I started at C B C in Halifax I was getting calls by my third night saying, you've got to come see this little kid play hockey in Cole Harbor. And it was hard to get a camera at night at CBC for anything other than council meetings or political events. It was a lot of overtime involved and haggling. And especially for the new sports guy, it was hard for him to ask for a camera in a union shop where it's costing money. But I kept getting these calls. And finally, uh, a sports guy up here named Pat Connolly, who I admired Im immensely, told me, go do a story on this Crosby kid. And I said, okay, if Pat says to do it, I'm going to try to do it. So we went, and in the very first game I ever saw Sidney Crosby play, he was eight years old. He was playing against 10-year-old kids. His team won the game 13-9, to and he had 11 goals and three assists in the game. And after the game, we sat him down for his first ever, ever TV interview, and I, I said to him, when did you know you were a good hockey player? And with kind of the mix of I guess, politeness and humility, but quiet confidence that still defines him to this day. He said, I remember last year in novice, I had 189 goals in 12 games. And I realized I might have a scoring touch. And I thought, my God, isn't that beautiful? Little guy thinks he might have a scoring touch. He's averaging like 10 a game. So uh, to be there at the birth of that and to see him grow and to do a story on him basically every year, and to still be able to call him a friend today, that's a very, very lucky thing for me. That has nothing to do with, with talent. That has nothing to do with anything other than being in the right place at the right time and getting to watch this little kid become an icon and still a great young man to this day. Bruce, uh, after your, following your career with uh, CPC in, uh, in Nova Scotia and in uh, PEI and with CBC Sports, uh, uh, I mean that that that's a, an amazing career itself. But you weren't you weren't done. Uh, then we see that you were uh, appointed president and CEO of uh, the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame. How did that come to be? Well, Gary, you know how you whether it's on your wall above your bed or it's just in your head, you have little little boxes you tick that you'd love to accomplish in a career. And I I kind of had done that at CBC. I still loved it, but but I I really had been lucky enough to do all the things I, I really wanted to do. And I figured, well, here's a chance to, to move on and to help tell the stories of the athletes from my home province who have achieved worldwide greatness and at the same time kept this healthy liberal dose of humility. You know, the, the Nova Scotia athlete is a, a pretty cool beast, just wonderful people who never did a sport or played a sport for acclaim or applause or standing ovations or awards. They did it because they loved it. They did it to be part of their respective communities. But what I get to do is sort of lead a group that tries to tell these stories and make sure that kids know around this province that, yes, you too, you know, even if you're from Port Hood, Cape Breton, 
you like Al McGinnis, if you work hard and shoot a lot of pucks against your dad's barn, you can make the NHL too. Or you like Sidney Crosby, if you're devoted and humble and stick with it, you too can. And I just love that. that that's a great job trying to tell these stories well and make sure they're told forever. So that really was attractive to me, and I am so thankful that the board of directors uh, liked my interview and offered me the job. But you've expanded on that. You, you weren't satisfied with just taking over a museum-like atmosphere. You, you, you put together a, a television show on top of that with Eastland Community TV. Yes, and it's called Legends of the Hall. And thank goodness it was a fairly easy sell because they, they trusted my ability to produce a show, given, given the background I had, which was great. So there was a confidence back and forth there. And the idea there, guys, is, Gary, you know this yourself, most of the time... Uh, people in the news or in sports are heard in like maybe, you know, if you're lucky, a 20-second sound bite. Most of the time it's more like 15. Here was a chance for th- this person to sit across from me and, and tell their story for a half hour. And to me, these stories deserve that. I want to know where they're from and who their influences were and their challenges along the way and the pinnacle of their careers and what they've learned and what kids can learn from their stories. And in a half hour, you can get into all of that and hopefully even more. So, that's been a great part of the job, and I think, Quinn, we've done about 60, 62 of those, and uh, as long as we keep inducting classes every year, we'll keep doing them because there's new Hall of Famers every single year. How important is it to you to, to be able to do that and, and tell or have people tell their stories? You know what? If, if, you don't, if you don't give them a vehicle to tell them, these stories disappear, uh, and you don't want them to disappear. They're way too important. They're way too educational. Uh, kids could glean so much from them. So to answer your question, hugely important. And I think if you, you know, it's it's ignorant of you not to not to do everything in your power to allow these stories and these people to, to be heard and figure out what made them tick. And that's how we learn and grow, and that's how we inspire and help the, the next generation get a feel for what made these people so special. So in, in your current space, or, or the space that where the museum was in, in, in the Scotiabank Centre, you kind of grew that spot, and, and now you're on, on the lookout for a, for a new spot. Where are you at in that process? We're very close to signing off on a deal to a, with regard to a new spot and making that announcement. You're right. We, have, we only had about 4,600 square feet, and, and to do this properly, I, I really think we need about three times that amount. So we have found a spot and a landlord... Who, who believes in our vision and has offered us a, a great rate on a beautiful piece of real estate. So um, I don't think by the time this airs, the announcement will have happened, but I would say by early to, to mid-April, you'll, you'll hear something, and I hope you guys are both able to come up and see our brand-new Sport Hall of Fame when it's built sort of 18 months from now. Well, we certainly promise to uh, follow up and make sure that we, uh, we get a chance to do that. Uh, one thing from, from that as well, Bruce, I mean, what percentage of the artifacts and, and material that you have were you actually able to display in, in that current location? Best guess is 5 or 6%. That's it. Wow. So everything's in storage, right? And that always really bothered me because these really cool things are being kept in a climate-controlled, secure environment, which is great, but nobody can see them. And so unless you're changing them out all the time, which is really hard, um, you know, your permanent display features only 5% of your collection, so that's one reason why we want more space, because it's fun to go into a museum and, and look at how it used to be done or look at a milestone stick from a milestone goal or a, a cool baseball, what it meant to a league 50 years ago. That's just cool stuff, and, and I believe we all have that kind of reflective gene in us. We like to be taken back to a time that meant something to us as a kid, so... We need more room for, for that gene to be satisfied, and we're looking for that now and are pretty close to finding it. Out of the material that you had on display, though, Bruce, what would you say was your most prized and or most visited possession? That's really easy, really easy. So years ago when Sidney Crosby was playing hockey in his basement, his father converted the rec room into a, a makeshift rink, and the, the net was at one end. And so when Sidney would shoot for the top right corner, blocker side for a right-handed goalie, if he missed, the puck would continue on and ricochet into his mother's dryer. And so we have this dryer, and this dryer was featured 
on the Jay Leno Tonight Show and in a very beautiful Tim Hortons ad. We have that, and it's puck marked and it's destroyed, and the, the knobs are all bust off. And we have people coming from Pennsylvania every year by the thousands, like a pilgrimage, to get their picture taken beside this dryer. So that that is by far our most popular item. We have a lot of cool stuff, but that is the one that I think uh, more people know about than any other. And the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto wants it. Well, that's too bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure they do. But they're not going to have it. They're not going to get it, are they, Bruce? Not for a while. No, Sydney's been very good to us, and it's, um, <laughs> Bruce, he knows how important it is to us. So he's a Nova Scotia boy, first and foremost. Yes, Bruce. I'm, I'm uh, again still. I've always been just just amazed at, at, at your career, starting off as a so young, and 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 you're still you're still a young person. Where do you? And I know this is probably a tough question, but where do you see yourself in, in, in five years? What What's next for Bruce Rainey? Well, hopefully, Gary, still doing a really good job at the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame, still getting an occasional call to help out with CBC on some of their, their big events, but mostly, and it's amazing how your perspective changes. You know, 20 years ago, um, you know, I would have given my eye teeth to be a regular on Hockey Night in Canada. Now I'd give my eye teeth just to just to make sure life's good for my two boys, right? That, that's all that matters, ultimately. I think we're all here to make sure the next generation has a good shot. And that honestly is, uh, you know, the work is a great thing. It's wonderful. It's fulfilling. But when you, <laughs> when you become a dad, you realize all that really matters is just, just make sure these guys are equipped to, to know which stones in the river are slippery and which are secure and when to make those steps, you know. So that ultimately is, is what drives me right now Bruce you're an inspiration not just to to broadcasters or or uh, people who want to become broadcasters or authors or or what have you but you're an inspiration to uh, uh, to everyone and and uh, you know your comments earlier about what about being passionate uh, about what you do and caring for others and, and doing the best and volunteering when you can uh, th- those things are so important you're certainly the embodiment of that you know what, Gary? I, I got to one of one of the highlights of my life was a chance to interview Stephen Lewis when he came through PEI, and I remember asking him a question like, "What what have you learned along the way?" And and what he said is the most simple thing. But he said, "The only thing that matters, the only thing is just trying to help people. Right? That, that's all there is." And uh, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> that's all there is. That's all there is. You just want to. You want to leave the world a little bit of a better place, and if you can leave a little bit of a mark, that's great. But but make sure you're you're helping out folk, and and uh, you know that's why I loved Yarmouth so much. Yarmouth was full of those sorts of people and those sorts of events and that sort of charity, and that's why that small town is is still so important to me. Bruce, thank you so much. You've brought back some so many fond memories of uh, when you and I worked together, and and. We appreciate your time so much and really excited to see uh, uh, what's going to happen next in, in the near future with the uh, Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame, which you're president and CEO. Bruce, thanks. Maybe when these COVID restrictions uh, lift, we can uh, we can see each other sometime and get you down that there to visit. That would be tremendous, Gary. Thanks, guys, for letting me drone on, and I wish you the very best of luck with this endeavor. I know, Gary, that uh, I know a lot of people, myself included, just miss hearing your voice it's one of the great staple voices on any radio station anywhere and to have you back on a podcast is awesome it's comforting for a lot of people so congrats guys quinn you're a beauty and uh, anytime i could help you let me know guys thank you my friend you're welcome to come down and call a mariners game anytime you get the itch (laughs) okay send send me a couple of programs so i can study up on the names okay (laughs) absolutely absolutely all right Our guest in this segment was Bruce Rainey. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this has been Outside My Window. Outside My Window.